Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. On a four-day visit to India to review initiatives in mutual cooperation, Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe today met Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Besides regional peace and terrorism, both leaders discussed areas to further widen cooperation. The Sri Lankan Prime Minister later met business leaders in Bengaluru to seek cooperation in software technology. The visiting dignitary also called on President Ramnath Kovind and apprised him of the situation in Sri Lanka. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the way forward for Indo-Sri Lanka ties. Joining me on the program today are Smriti Patnaik, Research Fellow, Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis. Leela K. Punnapa, former diplomat, joins us on the program as well. Commodore C. Uday Baskar, Director, Society for Policy Studies. And we'll also be joined by other guests during the course of the program. Uh, I'd like to start with the lady on the program first, Smriti Patnaik. You know, as far as uh, the visiting Prime Minister's visit to India is concerned, how do you think it has gone on thus far? I think it is a significant move in terms of uh, India's proposition to go for joint ventures in Sri Lanka. Uh, this is the second biggest joint venture which India probably is entering into apart from the Tunkumali oil farm where again India had proposed to develop along with, the, with Sri Lanka and also Japan. Uh, and I think uh, given uh, the fact that the Hambantota port is being developed by China and there are the special economic zone which is being developed, the, this particular airport, the Matala International Airport, other, otherwise known as Rajapaksa International Airport, uh, which actually, you know, will uh, further receive boost because earlier it was described as world's emptiest airport. So therefore, one has to look at this, but the potential of this particular airport, along with uh, various development which is going to take place in Hambantota. So I think it is a it is a very significant uh, development. Though the joint venture is a kind of thing which India and India has always uh, proposed with uh, many of the developing countries and uh, here it is 70-30 uh, with a 40 years of kind of equity which India is going to get into. Probably, you know, uh, the proposal now is that GMR may get this uh, particular project. Uh, so therefore, I think the India-Sri Lanka relations have come uh, in a long way as far as the developmental partnership is uh, concerned. And similarly, on the issue, political issue in Sri Lanka, there is this constitutional reform proposal which is being discussed in Sri Lanka and therefore one sees probably it will lead to some sort of solution to the long pending ethnic crisis. Sure. Uh, so therefore these will bring in uh, a kind of a forward looking India Sri Lanka relations than what one has seen in the past. You know, quite a few things raised by you. I think the ethnic uh, uh, issue will take up uh, just a little ahead in the program. But before that I want to talk about Hampantota. You know, uh, uh, Commodore is, is the airport in Hampantota a counter to the port that China is building or built at Hampatota? Well, I wouldn't quite call it a counter, largely because the Chinese investment has been in the port in the maritime domain and India is now evinced interest in the airport. Hmm. But perhaps one could talk about India also trying to make a certain investment, a political investment as also an infrastructure kind of investment in relation to how China is now engaged with Sri Lanka. And as Smriti has rightly pointed out, the India-Sri Lanka relationship has got a certain distinctive quality. And despite whatever be the kind of discord that we've had in the past on certain issues, even the Sri Lankan leadership has repeatedly said that as far as India and China are concerned, India is a brother and China is a friend. Hmm. And we are trying to find the kind of harmonization as far as both our neighbors are concerned or both Asian powers are concerned. So to that extent, I think this is a very important visit. And between Hamban Tota, both as port and as the airport, I think represent a certain challenge for India's neighborhood policy. Because we are looking at two aspects here. One, what is it that India can bring to the table? Hmm. And Sri Lanka has been a particularly, I would say, positive example of a very beneficial relationship if you look at the trade arrangements and what has happened over the last two decades and the way in which India has been able to provide a fair amount of positive, I would say, support across a wide range of issues. But Hambantota slash the airport at Matala is now, I think, a test case to see how India and China can perhaps work together mm. in the same geographic area almost with a very important neighbor from the Indian perspective. And Sri Lanka is equally important for China in relation to OBOR, BRI and the other initiatives that they are part of. 
So I think we should, and it's also, I think, as again, Smriti pointed out, next week is a very major meeting in Sri Lanka between the Sri Lankan port authorities and Chinese entity that is going to be operating the whole Hamban Tota enterprise. So I think this is an important visit in that perspective and for India to establish its credibility because our ability to deliver and implement projects within required timelines and the kind of financial costing that has been done has not always been up to speed. Mm. Mm. So these are some of the areas where I think India should be looking. And finally, if I may add, for Prime Minister Modi, this is very important because he came to office in 2014 with the neighborhood first policy. Yes. So each neighbor of India is distinctive. India, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka and so on. I think Sri Lanka is the most enabling of the bilaterals that we have. And it could also serve as a kind of model template for the other neighbors that a positive relationship with India, despite the disparity in size and asymmetry, can have a lot of win-win kind of outcomes. Sure. sure. Uh, let me go to Ambassador Punapa now. You know, Ambassador, as far as uh, what India can bring to the table, that's what we've been discussing about. What is it that India can bring to the table and offer Sri Lanka that China can't? Well, I think the kind of understanding that exists between India and Sri Lanka is uh, something that is, as Uday very rightly pointed out, quite uh, unique and uh, distinctive. It's not a question of what can India do that China can't and so on. There are many countries that have the same capabilities. But it's a question of how Sri Lanka views where its interests lie and where they believe that the net result would really work for the benefit of Sri Lanka and its people. It uh, might encompass specific technical capabilities. It might encompass uh, financial packages and how they are delivered. It might encompass the actual implementation of a project on the ground. But above all, I think it revolves around a kind of culture of openness, the ability to dialogue, and the ability not to uh, take undue advantage through, let's say, the kind of financing arrangements that would create an unsustainable debt. I do believe that in that respect, India's policies towards its neighbors, not just Sri Lanka, but Bangladesh, other countries, the kind of loans and credits that it offers, usually in rupee terms, which means they're not subject to uh, uh, exchange rate fluctuations and so on. I think these are uh, meant to be supportive and beneficial. So I think the level of understanding that does and uh, can exist between India and Sri Lanka is something that provides a very strong foundation to build on any type of project that the two countries decide would be in their mutual benefit. Sure. You know, uh, Smriti Patnaik, from, from a strategic point of view, how important is Sri Lanka for us? Uh, surely, you know, from the there is no question of uh, how important it is. It is important, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, being a country in the uh, Indian Ocean, and uh, second is that the large uh, ethno-cultural and religious linkages the two countries share, and there is vast amount of uh, you know military cooperation between the two countries, uh, which actually. Uh, many many of the time is underplayed for uh, different reasons. There has been training. Uh, India has been training the Sri Lankan, uh, you know, uh, armed forces for very uh, very long time, and it has uh, provided uh, you know the weapons like, for example, offshore uh, petrol vehicle uh, support, um, radar support, and apart from that, if you look at the 2009 war, India supported uh, provided the very. Uh, I would say that uh, probably the significant, significant component in any kind of war, that is the intelligence uh, support, which resulted in uh, uh, probably the war uh, ending in a particular pattern, you know, the defeat of the LTT. So therefore, I, I would say that Sri Lanka is surely uh, very strategic uh, from the point of view of India's uh, Indian Ocean strategy. But also at the same time, I would like to say that if you look at uh, the entire geography and Chinese a recent forays into Indian Ocean, I think it acquires a much more strategic significance in terms of China's activities in the region. Uh, we have seen in the last uh, three years back when the, uh, you know, when the submarine, nuclear submarine had uh, docked in the Colombo uh, port. And obviously there are certain concerns which India has. 
but uh, I think there is a lot of synergy, I would say, in India-Sri Lanka relations, not just in political terms, but also like uh, Comrade Udhavaskar was mentioning about the economic, where we are go getting into the ECTA, that is the uh, you know Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, that was earlier the term, but uh, it is the Technical Economic uh, Cooperation Agreement. Uh, I feel that uh, the movement has been, uh, in a sense, uh, very gradual, and therefore I would say that you know it is much more of a kind of not just comprehensive, but also a little solid when you move gradually, sure. rather than you know reacting to particular incidents. I think both the countries have been mature enough to see, you know, to look at each other's strength and see where they can cooperate and take the relationship further. Sure, yes, uh, Commodore. May I just add to this, I think, you know, when you say how important is Sri Lanka to India and what is the strategic underpinning, I'd extend the formulation made by Dr. Patnaik and say that if you look at the geography of Sri Lanka and look at the geography of India, and we often say that India has not been conscious or cognizant of its maritime potential, mm. And my standard advocacy, Frank, let me get away with this on Rajya Sabha TV. We should put the map of India upside down, hmm. meaning that let's look at the southern direction pointing upwards. And there you'll see Sri Lanka, literally like a pearl in the ocean. And this vast maritime domain, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal. And I would aver that purely in terms of its potential, because of geography, Sri Lanka will be critical for India in maximizing its potential in the extended global commons, which is the maritime domain, space, and cyber. Okay. All of them are interconnected. And we just have to recall the Manila summit where Prime Minister Modi had gone. Mm. And we had this focus on the Indo-Pacific. So I think the short point is that the global economic activity, global strategic considerations are all moving into this extended maritime continuum which is the Pacific, the Western Pacific, through the Malacca to India and East Africa and the Persian Gulf. I think Sri Lanka's location is critical, which is why the Chinese are also investing in Sri Lanka in the manner that they are. We in India have the advantage of a very old and a very special relationship with them. And I think the very fact that, again, purely in terms of the reality, Colombo port and Sri Lanka's ability to receive global trade because as you know Indian ports do not have the ability to receive the larger ships. Yes. So we are actually dependent on Sri Lanka and its own maritime infrastructure for India to be able to be part of various global chains. Quad plus one can you say? Well in a way yes why not because quad is also about like-minded countries. Sure. So I think as these flexible partnerships evolve Sri Lanka to my mind would be very critical for India I think in the next two or three decades. Because technology is going to push India into maritime cyberspace. And if the blue economy is to be realized by India, which again is Prime Minister Modi's great vision, Sagar, hmm. security and growth for all in the region, yes. Sri Lanka, I would submit, would have a very, very important role. Okay, Sri Lanka will have an important role is something that all the panelists have, have you know, driven home uh, so far. Let's talk about bilateral yeah, ties. I? Yes, yes, sure. Yes, Ambassador, go ahead. No, I'd uh, just like to fully endorse everything that Uday has said, because it's not even a question that uh, bears uh, asking, since uh, Sri Lanka's uh, uh, location and uh, I would say policies are uh, so intrinsically connected with those of India. And therefore, I think the extent to which there is a deep understanding and there has been for most of the time, even when there have been differences, I think there was always the possibility of dialogue and uh, ultimately uh, some kind of uh, resolution. And this is really what gives strength to the relationship. Two other points. Uh, you know, the Sri Lankan equation with China isn't just recent. It goes back really to the early years after independence. And uh, some of your audience might recall what was known as the rice for rubber deal when Sri Lanka was essentially an exporter of raw materials, desperately needed rice. India did not have the food supplies at that time, but uh, Sri Lanka had rubber, which they sent to China, and uh, China sent across rice. Uh, China also built a couple of large infrastructure projects at that time, including the Bandarnaika Convention Center and so on. But the security interests of Sri Lanka, when they were threatened, it was India that Sri Lanka turned to. 
including in 1971 when you had the JVP armed insurrection and uh, Prime Minister Sirima Bandaranaika called, uh, to, uh, called India for help. So uh, this is not a relationship that can be equated with uh, any other. And I think in, uh, in particular, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has had a certain vision. And in many respects, Sri Lanka has really been ahead of the pack in the region. Hmm. Whether it is in terms of recognizing the potential of developing linkages with uh, Southeast Asia, in terms of economic reform, where in effect they were the pioneer in the region and so on. So it's a, it's, it's a good relationship. It's based on continuous dialogue not necessarily always through agreement, but I do believe that there is a deep appreciation of each other. I, I think we've established the fact that, you know, the relationship is extremely strong and it's also very important going forward for us. So in our next segment, we'll try and understand how to enhance bilateral ties between the two countries. Sanjay Kapoor, editor of The Hard News, joins us on the program now. Uh, Sanjay, how do we take the relationship to the next level? I think there are certain uh, problems that, that kind of cropped up some years back, but now they're getting sorted out. Uh, what Sri Lanka wants is, I think, uh, a certain amount of respect, which every small neighbor is, uh, demands from a bigger country. Uh, they think that India is civilizationally part of them. They feel very strongly about it. But they wonder as to why uh, there is less Indian investment, especially private sector investment in uh, Sri Lanka. Their claim is that if the private sector from India was investing in Sri Lanka, they would have had no reason to go to China or look elsewhere. And that is where they think that there is a, big, a bit of a gap which can be sorted out. So if there is going to be a next round of development, if they need to uh, take the relationship to the next level, there has to be, you know, engagement between the two countries at, uh, at different levels, at the uh, level of private sector involvement in the, terms of uh, greater understanding on uh, issues, especially pertaining to the fishermen problem that keeps coming up, that we've not been able to resolve. So there are niggles keep on hurting relationship between the two countries, but I think there is uh, not such a major problem as it is made out to be. Okay, not much of a problem as far as uh, the ties between the two countries are, are concerned, but Commodore, issues such as the fishermen issue, the ethnic problems that exist, do you think that these could be an irritant going forward? Well, I would say that these are issues that are on the table, on the radar, literally. And I think the fisherman issue is something that has both an old history to it. And both sides, I think, are politically committed to finding a way out of it. But again, let me add, and I'm sure Smriti can add to this, about the dynamic of domestic politics, particularly as far as Tamil Nadu and the sensitivities that were brought to the table largely because of the Tamil Nadu, Sri Lanka and the diaspora and all of those issues. Now, world over, I think fishermen going into each other's waters. We've seen this in Europe, we've seen this in Latin America, we're seeing it in parts of Asia and in ASEAN. It needs to be resolved and I'm a little hopeful saying that now technology allows much greater levels of surveillance and monitoring between the two sides and one hopes that this would definitely find some kind of a modus vivendi. But I do want to add one point, if I may, Frank about what is it that we can also perhaps learn or what are the kind of give and take with Sri Lanka. One thing that has often struck me is that if we talk about human security, South Asia's greatest challenge, Southern Asia's greatest challenge, including China, I would say is the level of human security, the metric of human security, health, education, literacy, gender issues and so on. I think Sri Lanka provides a model. If you look at many of the UN indicators and traditionally, Sri Lanka has always been ahead of the pack, as Leela had said just now. Their ability, I think, to provide this kind of basic human security is something that most of South Asia can perhaps draw some lessons from. We in India are committed to certain goals. Prime Minister talks about Swaj Bharat, open defecation, etc. Sri Lanka has managed pretty well. Mm. And the other is the kind of municipal discipline that Sri Lanka has been able to bring in small towns, Colombo apart. And this is something which has again been a USP. And I think India should perhaps look at this and see what are the kind of best practices that we often talk about, which can be part of both the bilateral as also, I think, at the regional SARC level. And in this, I think Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh brings a lot of experience and sagacity to the table. Sure. And that should also be, I think... Sure. Good. You know, talking about best practices, you know, let's talk about areas of cooperation between the two countries. What do we need to focus on going forward? I think one is that, you know, uh, 
Sanjay was speaking about uh, this uh, private sector investment, this economic and technical cooperation agreement, which is being negotiated, as you know, the previous SIPA yeah, uh, was, uh, I think, uh, you know, they, they, it was stalled. It was, uh, in fact, it was negotiated for nearly years and it's unfortunate that it was stalled for political reasons because uh, SIPA had become a bad term. So you need to reinvent and uh, the the... Uh, economic and technical cooperation agreement probably will provide a kind of space for the private sector to invest much more in Sri Lanka. Of course, having said that, I would say that uh, you already have the Renuka Sugar, which is uh, already in the escorts uh, medical services. Then there are software companies which are already investing there. Then the ICIC bank and other small private sectors have moved in, but you don't see the larger investment probably with uh, the economic and technical cooperation agreement. Uh, with the service coming in, which is again, you know, what I feel that it is part of SAFTA. If countries can agree on trade in services under SAFTA, why can't they agree bilaterally is something which is a little difficult for me sometimes to understand when, you know, it gets stuck in bilateral negotiation. Uh, as far as looking forward is concerned, even again on the fisherman issue, like for example, the two countries right now are taking steps to introduce uh, the modern, uh, you know, machineries and tools where the fisherman knows where it is going to you know cross the border the maritime boundary and second uh, the major uh, objection of sri lanka has been that the bottom trawling mm. which is actually affecting the marine resources and therefore there is a kind of discussion where these fishermen can be you know provided with a kind of equipment where they can move into the deep sea and do sure. the tuna fishing fishing and also i think there is some progress in that uh, aspect and coming to the aspect of uh, the, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, putting it into the economic aspect, the fisherman, which, you know, uh, immediately after the end of the war, you thought, oh my God, this is the only issue which is going to derail the bilateral relations. The third issue, I would say, again, you know, the political issue, uh, which at least this government has been uh, committed to, and at least seen to be taking certain, uh, you know, steps, sure. uh, which actually will lead to the long-term resolution of the ethnic issues. That actually, once the, you know, the moment that particular political aspiration of the Tamil community has been made within whatever the government of Sri Lanka is mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. offer, that will provide a broad space for the two countries to have close cooperation. Sure. I think uh, that is what we need at the moment. Sure. I've got about two minutes left on the program, so I'm trying to squeeze in two closing comments from uh, my other two panelists, starting yeah. with you, starting with you, Ambassador. Ambassador, you know, trade in 2016 between the two countries stood at, I think, about 4.4 billion US dollars. How do we take that up a notch? Well, as uh, one who advocated and was directly involved with the uh, idea, the negotiation and the implementation of the India-Sri Lanka Free Trade Agreement of 1998, which despite all the uh, issues that keep coming up, because a free trade relationship is a progression, it is not just an event, it's a process. Uh, if you take a look at the trade figures uh, in terms of Sri Lanka's exports to India before the FTA and let's say two years thereafter once the systems were in place, Sri Lanka's exports have doubled. The whole objective was to enable Sri Lanka to derive maximum benefit from the Indian market. Right. And if one were to study the rules of origin in that initial FTA, they were designed to encourage investment in Sri Lanka uh, and also the manufacturing of products using, deriving some uh, raw materials or uh, components from India by which they would get the benefit of uh, tariff-free entry into the Indian market. Mm. Now, uh, an economic relationship necessarily needs to go beyond trade. It needs to go to investment. It needs to go to connectivity. Sure. Uh, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has authored the whole concept of what he calls the modern Hanuman Setu, of connectivity between Sri Lanka and India through a bridge uh, by road and by rail. Okay. Uh, in addition you know, to the resumption of the uh, of the ferries that had uh, that used to exist between uh, India, Sri Lanka and India, and of course uh, air connections. Now this would be a vast project. There has okay. been talk about you, power you, sharing you, you, across the Park Straits. That again would give each country a stake in the other's stability and progress. 
in, in order to get to maximize the benefits from both All right. sides. And well, you know, I'm sorry to cut you short there, Ambassador, but I've, com I've completely run out of time on the program today. And Sanjay Kapoor, I'm sorry I can't let you have a last say because uh, we are completely out of time on today's big picture. Thank you for watching and thank you to all my guests as well for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us.